in the recent days there's been a a a discussion around how journalists are increasingly being targeted by the Zionist entity. There was a much-loved uh, vlogger that used TikTok to give us insight into what it is like living under genocide and not just the gruesome aspects, aspects of it, but also the, the, the daily lived challenges with living in a tent um, and making food and having an air cut and trying to live... Life, because Palestinians want to live life. And uh, journalists that have tried to encapsulate this experience, um, the anything from the, 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 the building coming down to uh, jets flying low and all of these sorts of things have been targeted. And the Committee for the Protection of Journalists, the CPJ, recently determined that five journalists were directly targeted by Israeli occupation forces. Uh, they are Isam Abdullah, Hamza Abdadu, uh, Mustafa Thureya, Ismail Al-Ghul and Rami Al-Rafi that were all targeted. They were deliberately murdered by the Zionist entity and so the word on the street if one were to use that colloquially is that wearing a press vest is a death sentence for reporters one of whom had been reporting from Gaza for some time and she's currently on a visit to South Africa Yumna Al Said she's an award-winning journalist uh, known for her fearless reporting amidst the Israeli genocide of her people Yumna is among very many brave Palestinian journalists that are now bringing to the world's attention the human stories behind the headlines uh, Yumna uh, now joins us uh, online uh, assalamu alaikum and welcome to to Radio 786 in Cape Town, South Africa. Alaikum assalam. Thank you so much for having me on your show. Of course, it's uh, difficult to make uh, the distinction between, um, you know, just being a journalist and being Palestinian at the end of the day, living under these conditions. Uh, but the former is a lot more. I suppose, uppermost in mind because it is the former that brings us the story that relays the experience of what's happening on the ground. And for that, it would appear that journalists are are being targeted. Uh, Can you maybe give us a a sense of what that duty entails, what the experience it would be uh, operating as a journalist in Gaza today? Uh, Gaza is not like any other place in the world. Unfortunately, being a Palestinian journalist in Gaza or even in the occupied West Bank does not guarantee your safety. Being labeled as a journalist with your press gear and press vest and press helmet, that does not even guarantee your safety. All international conventions and uh, international laws and humanitarian laws, they don't guarantee your safety as a journalist to be protected and not targeted while on duty, while you are marked as a journalist. On the contrary, Israel finds it very uh, all right and very okay to continue targeting journalists in any kind of military escalation, conflict, war, or in this genocide. So um, it's not just the targeting of the of the human journalist, it, begins every single time with its targeting of journalists by targeting our media offices. This is how we begin every single war. It's targeting our media offices so that we are not able to work uh, properly. We do not have the convenient places, our our tools, our instruments, our, our machines to work, our equipment. And this is how our work always gets very difficult, very challenging, a lot of struggle as we report. But despite all these struggles and challenges, we have never, as Palestinian journalists, never one time gave up and stopped reporting. Not because we fear for our lives that are constantly in risk, and not because we don't have the adequate and convenient places and equipment to work with. And and how difficult does that make uh, relaying the story? Because oftentimes it would appear that uh, sometimes where the bombing does happen, where there are targeted operations, um, you know, and, and again targeted, I, I use 
you know very very liberally yeah uh, but also the 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 way in which it would appear that where there is media attention and focus to to document the atrocities of the zionist entity that it is those messengers that that are, are being targeted in in particular do you have any accounts of 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 maybe some of your colleagues in which they 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 speak of of being hounded or being followed or and or you know um you know having some of these attacks happen quite deliberately close <coughs> to where they may well be um no. in, in a way to stifle the story from getting out are, are there accounts like that well of course i mean when there is a gathering of uh, journalists anywhere in the field there is always targeting towards the journal the journalists themselves either to scare them out, to leave the area. <coughs> I'm sorry. <coughs> or by targeting them while they are at the field in their cars, returning or going back in uh, from that particular area. I mean, Ismail Al-Ghul, recently Al Jazeera colleague, uh, Al Jazeera Arabic uh, correspondent in Gaza City, he was targeted with uh, Rami Rifi in their car after they were told to leave the area. They heeded right away to the order of leaving the area and they were instantly targeted in their car. Uh, Samir Abu Da'a, my, my other colleague uh, for Al Jazeera, also was targeted while covering an airstrike on a school with Wa'il al Dahtuh. Wa'il was injured while Samir was left bleeding with his injury. We called the Israeli army, we discussed with them, we tried to negotiate with them. We just wanted to send an ambulance inside to bring Samir, who was alive but injured. And the Israeli army completely refused all our approaches, refused all our calling out for for an in, for an ambulance to save Samir, and he was left there for hours until he succumbed for his wounds and he passed away. Isn't that a deliberate targeting while we are on duty? The fact that we could be right there identified as journalists and then we could get targeted by very nearby uh, missiles or even direct missiles on our heads or or gas grenades or or shots sniper shots the 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 history the the the, the numbers it's just a lot yeah and and you 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 wrote about this um uh, you know on previous occasion uh, where you spoke about how every single time you saw some of the bombardments take place around your home and your neighborhood you couldn't stop yourself from you know still being you know the 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 the, the, the mother the you know the person that's afraid for your for your family for your kids uh, you you spoke about the ability to want to try and protect them uh, yet of course continuing to keep the camera rolling so that there is a recording that the rest of the world can see uh, you you spoke about you know losing family members and 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 colleagues uh, as it were and that for the first time that you you felt real fear and felt afraid was after a while the do had had of course been martyred um wh- this was a couple of months back already and 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 since then of course life has been you know quite the living hell e- ever since then uh, and of course with the, with the, the constant reality of moving from one area to the next where where the zionist entity says this is a safe passage or this is a safe uh, zone as it were, how safe would you say these zones and passages are for people like yourselves and others to have done their work? I was terrified when I was home because as any Palestinian journalist, there's always this struggle between keeping or knowing that your family, your loved ones could be in danger and their lives could be threatened just because you're a journalist and the fact that you have a a duty, a responsibility at these times to be out there in the field and to continue reporting on what is happening, on the atrocities that are unfolding. One week after uh, Wa'al Dahdouh's family was targeted, I received a direct threat in my home and I was trapped in my apartment and the bombardments wouldn't stop from around my apartment. Two days later, the Israeli snipers were just 20 meters away 
shooting sniper bullets on my apartment. They rained the gates of the of the building with bullets. They tank shelled it. All this while we're inside our home, we were given five minutes, five minutes to escape for our lives before they reopened their fire. You can imagine the feeling as a parent. I'm speaking as a parent now, as a mother, as a father with your children in such conditions, in such moments. And you know that they have gone through this because you are a journalist, simply because you are their mother. Leaving that moment when your child would tell you they're going to kill us because of you is the worst feeling you would feel in your life as a mother. But yet, it was always the struggle, the ongoing pain, the ongoing challenges that the people are living that kept me going, that kept every single Palestinian journalist going. Because if we don't inform this world, if we abandon our people, like all other journalists have abandoned Gaza, what else is left? How are these atrocities going to be exposed? Israel succeeded in preventing all international journalists from entering Gaza. They suppressed the freedom of press. They suppressed the freedom of speech. But they did not succeed in putting us down as Palestinian journalists in preventing us from doing our job. Because our job, I always say, our motivation is not just our profession. It's not just our professional duty. It's our moral and ethical duty towards our people. Mm. that we don't let them down. And that comes at, at a great amount of bravery because, again, I, I reflect on some of the things that, that you've, you've said on previous occasion, and, and you spoke about a phone call having been received by yourself personally to warn you that you could be targeted. Uh, who's on the other end of this call, and, and, and what are they saying? The, the phone call was not for me. The phone call was for my husband. He received it, and it was someone who identified himself as an IDF officer. He called from a private number. He identified my husband by his full name, and he told him a very short and simple message. We know who you are. Take your family and leave your home right now. Otherwise, your lives are in danger in the upcoming hours. And my husband responded saying that you say you know who we are. That means that you know that we are under ongoing bombardment for the past two days. How can I risk the lives of my children and take them to the street like that? He said, this is your problem. Figure it out. We've warned you. And the call ended. Two days later, they were right there in front of our building, forcing us out of our home under sniper bullets and tank shells. And so that is why the story uh, and the very many stories you've told, one that you most personally yourself experienced, is one that should, you know, certainly find a place in, in our discourse uh, more more so than than what it has in the last couple of weeks. There's there's been a almost a dithering, a slow down uh, in, in some of the solidarity work. Uh, one can almost understand that some may well be fatigued. And, and again, you, 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 you previously wrote about saying, and you, you said, you know, you wrote saying that, I tell myself every day, I tell myself, Yumna, you've got to get up, you've got to go to work. You've got to stand in front of that camera and tell people what is happening here because it's not fair that after the entire world has abandoned Gaza and its people, that they would even forget what is happening here. Was there at any stage that you felt whether it was worth it, standing in front of the camera, as you put it, it would appear that the world has abandoned Gaza? No, it's not all. It, it was never about being worth it or not. I know deeply in my heart, and I know it with all my senses, that yes, it's worth it, and it's worth it a hundred times. But we're human beings. I'm a human being. I was tired. I was mentally and physically tired and exhausted. I was pained. I did not have, I was just like any other pl- person in Gaza. I ate very little. I drank very little. I wore my press vest weighing 13 kilograms every single day for over 12 hours a day. I left my children terrified at home and I went out 
to report every single day. And I didn't sleep all night because my children were afraid and terrified of the bombardments and I was afraid for them. And we always anticipated, is that missile going to fall on our home? Are they going to call us to tell us to, to leave right now? It was a constant worry. You couldn't sleep. You couldn't sleep all night from the, the horrors and the terrors that you felt. So I'm a human being. I felt like I was giving up at moments. I felt like I couldn't bear it anymore. I couldn't bear the pain that I saw in hospitals among other children while I'm a mother. But I forced myself because the world needs to understand. When I stopped standing in front of the camera in, in December, I stopped giving up. I stopped giving live updates in front of the camera for hours because I was out there in the field with my cameraman every single day in a different area. We risked our life to bring those reports. You're going to find reports about everything, about children, their kind of injuries, the health system, the difficulties that women are living within, the tents and how people live in the tents, the areas that gets, get targeted, the neighborhoods, the things that people don't understand, these details that are filled with despair, they're filled with pain that every single Palestinian lived within. It's not just the numbers. Mm. It's not just a number of people who have been injured. People need to know what kind of injuries these vulnerable bodies of children in Gaza get injured. They need to know that those missiles cause three third degree burns in their bodies and that there are no medicines for such burns in Gaza. They need to know that the, the, when the missiles explode, they're full of shrapnel that hits and destroys meters away from the explosion or the direct, the directly uh, hit home or area. And that many people are risk for these shrapnels flying around. They needed to know about so many children. They needed to know about these things we can't tell people. We can't show them in the lives. And that's why I went out to make these stories, because I wanted people to understand the details, to feel the details. Yeah, and I, I, I and we sit uh, from a very far distance looking at uh, Instagram stories and reports. And when we watch Al Jazeera and we see you on screen and we, we, we listen to these accounts that you are trying to, to relay, some of us find it very difficult, you know, to, to look at those images where going to bed at night, when you do find a moment to rest, you know, I'm certain you from time to time relive these memories. And I'm almost wanting to ask whether you are dealing with that, whether you are, are processing that because notwithstanding the fact that you are a mother, you have your own children to worry about. But when I look at some of the images of skulls being blown away, babies looking like they, they, they're they resting, but, you know, they've been murdered because of the sheer force that, that comes with the missile landing, etc. You know, the, the amount of, of bodies that are wrapped around buildings and the blood stains. And I don't want to, you know, become too graphic about it, etc. But this is... What was your daily lived reality? And, and, and I'm almost wondering whether one could even find a restful night of sleep, notwithstanding that you're hungry, looking for water, looking for food, etc. And that when you move from area to area, sometimes you have to move your own personal life with it as well and as much as you're working. And so perhaps my parting and last question, a more human question to you is to ask you whether... But what your mental state is and, 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 and what dealing with that looks like. Trust me, as a human being, you can never get over seeing an 11-year-old carrying his 5-year-old in a backpack against his chest. You can never, ever get over that, no matter the years past. You can never get over the fact that your children were thirsty, that you had only half a bottle of water and put drops of water in the lid for them just to sip a little bit of water because you couldn't find water. Forget about hunger, but the fact that seeing children 
hungry and not being able to help them, your own children leave, living that despair, living that pain, you can never get over all these things. Every single time I close my eyes, I, I live everything again. I relive it again. It's always there in front of, of my eyes. People ask me, did you sleep every single night? And I smile because I've lost my ability to sleep months ago, months ago, before I even came out of Gaza, let alone the survival guilt that was continuously eating me when I came out of Gaza, knowing that I was able to leave that hell while many others are not, many other children like my children are not privileged enough and is still ongoing until now. But I'll tell you something, my only therapy started when I made up my mind that I will go around the world to speak about Gaza, to speak about the genocide of Gaza, to speak about the children of Gaza and what they're going through on a daily basis, to speak about their pain and their struggle that kept me going when I was in Gaza. This is what is helping me now. The fact that, no, I didn't abandon Gaza. I'm still there talking about it. I'm still trying to raise awareness towards what the people, the civilians, the children are struggling with every single day. And it's tragic. It's beyond tragic. It's beyond any ability of any human that they can go through and they can take. This is how I'm trying to help myself out. And there will be very many uh, days, months, weeks of 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 trying to to live with this uh, experience. I don't think you'll ever come out from it. Um, you know, being you must say it before October the seventh um, that that you may have been and even in that circumstance you are still a victim of occupation a victim uh, in which your movement is controlled and the type of resources that you do or do not have access to but life has become a lot more worse since october the 7th and came with all manner of sacrifice